My name is Jim Wilshire. I'm the Chief Public Affairs Officer for the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. I have had the privilege of working for PCAR, being an advocate for survivors of sexual abuse, harassment, and assault since 2019. Uh, I'm thankful for everyone that's here today so we can have a conversation about what sexual limitations reform means for adult survivors of child sexual abuse. And I will now walk us through some slides to help set the groundwork for what our conversation is going to be today and uh, have everyone have a better understanding of the impact this has on adult survivors. Um, we do wanna give special thanks to sponsors which help to make today's events possible. Uh, Robert Gamberg, as well as Schmidt and Kramer, we greatly appreciate their generosity in uh, providing the, the financial support so that we can reach out to our audience so that we can have um, full access to the conversation for today. Now, um, what we do wanna make today about is very, very much focused on survivors and uh, discussing their story to build on what we have talked about uh, in our prior session. But before we get started, we did wanna lay down some groundwork to make sure everyone can understand some of um, where we are today and how we got here in the, the fuller landscape of where we are with uh, the abuse that has happened over the years. So to begin with, um, unfortunately, this is uh, a crime that has been happening for decades. We've known about child sexual abuse across multiple institutions for uh, far too many years, and this is not just exclusive to Pennsylvania. Um, what we do know is that there are other states. Um, some of those include California, Connecticut, Delaware, Georgia, Hawaii, Minnesota, and Utah that have put in place some form of a window for survivors to be able to access a path to justice when session limitations has expired. We will talk a little bit about that today, um, but we'll talk about that more in an upcoming session. We're also looking to, to sponsor. Um, but we also know for Pennsylvania specifically is that we did a poll earlier this year in February, and we also know that 82% of the registered voters that were polled of 700 uh, registered Pennsylvania voters 82% support Pennsylvania also seeking a window for survivors to be able to seek uh, retroactive justice. And that could be um, used in, in, in different ways, but basically a look back window after the statute of limitations has, has expired. We also know that uh, from that poll that 27% of those um, same poll voters are not aware fully that survivors don't have access to this today. So while we know that there is support to allow survivors to, to seek this justice, um, it is still something that we are providing a lot of education for, which is why we're having this conversation today. Um, also on this slide, you'll notice that um, we are recognizing how many grand jury reports there have been to talk about this. As I said before, we've known about this being uh, an extremely egregious crime that's been happening for years. There's been multiple grand jury reports. Um, the, the most frequently cited now is um, the grand jury report that came out under Attorney General Shapiro in 2018. Um, but it is unfortunately, according to his report, the 40th grand jury report that has happened in, in Pennsylvania talking about this topic. We know that even in recent years, as far recently as 2014, there was a Dauphin County investigative grand jury report for Susquehanna Township School District. There was another in 2016 in, in um, Plum Senior High School and just countless others, which is a part of why we are also providing a lot of prevention education, but part of why we need to have a conversation today about why survivors need to have to act justice. The fortunate thing that we have is that in 2019, there was a historic number of bills that were passed with unanimous support in both the House and Senate. And this gave great uh, support to survivors, both in being able to establish crimes and having them prosecuted and offering support. What we do recognize is that this, uh, this shows that we've been able to do this once before by working with the legislature. And we do believe that we'll be able to work with the legislature to, to do what we want to do for statute of limitations today. Um, it's also something that in 2019 included some legislation which got derailed, which we'll talk about shortly. But in this package of bills in 2019, 
um, we did see the beginning of a lot of work that uh, had already had a foundation built, but it was just monumental that we have to say that as far as what we're talking about today, did get built in part on this. Now this slide will show what the current time limits are for statute of limitations. Now there's a lot of information here, but um, to try to make it easier for digestion, um, the, the bigger pieces to look at is the, the left column and the right column, where you're gonna be able to see what the ages are for um, when the time of assault happened, as well as what the statute of limitations are for each of these offenses. Um, what we're talking about today is this, this first one uh, where it's uh, under the 18, where child sexual abuse has always been considered a heinous crime in its own, own category and its own offense. And um, see, have, helping survivors seek justice for that is uh, what we're here to talk about today. So unfortunately, there are survivors that have missed their opportunity to pursue civil justice as a result of that slide we just saw for um, statute of limitations. For those that would could be um, considered to have aged out, we are talking about legislation that would have a one-time two-year window that could apply to civil damages, but also, and equally important, help to establish a public safety issue by having survivors be able to name the individuals or institutions that, that had a role to play in the abuse that happened to them so that anyone that may be living in anonymity today for abuse that happened in the past would have public spotlight shined on them so that others know of the abuse that had happened before. And while on its face, it might sound like that is um, something that is very easy to understand. We're gonna talk about what the importance of that is and how much that is needed and how much is unknown yet until everyone is able to fully listen to the survivors and take to heart their story and affect the change. The other thing is that we know that um, within the 301 victims that testify in grand jury reports, um, 299 have no legal recourse, which is that much more of a reason why we need to take action today so that those survivors can have justice. It is just too staggering and too horrifying of a stat to see. So what all that means for where we are today in that package of bills that I had referenced from 2019, one of those included a constitutional amendment, which is uh, something that survivors were greatly excited to be able to see after years and years of coming to the Capitol and telling their story to have finally had an opportunity to have a piece of legislation move forward for a constitutional amendment to allow this two-year window that we're talking about today. Now, while that process is very difficult to go through, because what a constitutional amendment basically means is that um, a bill needs to be passed in one session. So in this case, it was back in 2019, a second identical bill would need to be passed in the next legislative session. So for statute of limitations, what that means is when that bill passed 2019, another one needed to be passed as early as this year. Um, once that happened, then the bill would be able to move forward in the process and it would be placed on the next ballot for, um, gener for either a primary or a general election. So this year we were perfectly positioned that we could have seen in the spring primaries a constitutional amendment placed before the Pennsylvania electorate to allow survivors to have this opportunity for justice. There was gross negligence on the part of the Department of State that they did not honor their full legal requirements, and this did not happen. The, the failure was that the, there was not a notice posted in every county that the 2019 legislation had passed, and that violated other legal um, necessities. So it was basically null and void, and instead of being able to move forward in the process and give survivors justice, we are now in a position where 2021 is not passing the second identical legislative bill, 2021 starts the beginning of having to start this process 
all over again if we go down the path of the constitutional amendment. So instead of this being phase two, we are essentially at phase one all over again. What we are fortunate to have is that in 2021, we have passed House Bill 14, which does move forward the constitutional amendment to have the first bill. So the earliest that we could have that second bill passed is 2023, which means that the ability to have something posted for the uh, general public to vote on can't happen any sooner than 2023, which after survivors have had to wait years and years to be able to see something happen in the Capitol, asking to wait another day, another month, another two years is far too long. But more importantly, after PCAR and several other advocates and constitutional attorneys and others have looked into the issue, we believe that there is a quicker way through what is considered to be a statutory path, which is basically changing the constitution just as a constitutional amendment would do, but it does it through a different process rather than have it go through two legislative sessions and be put forward before the general public, a statutory path would essentially allow the General Assembly as a state legislature to amend the constitution. And in our assessment, which we are not here to talk about today, we will talk about that more in the third session that we host. Um, it, it would not violate the constitution to do so. There is a bill currently before the Senate, House Bill 951, which would essentially do that. And if it were sent to the governor's desk, it is possible that you know, as soon as it were sent to his desk and he signed it, we could see justice for survivors happen today or more, maybe more fair to say this legislative session rather than wait till another legislative session at an uncertain date in the future. PCAR supports both these bills and, and both pass. So we do support House Bill 14 and we do thank the legislature for their, their passage of that bill. It is a great indication of support for survivors. We think that House Bill 951 is also a great sign of support for survivors and is able to give uh, all the survivors more immediate relief and uh, a great strong sign of support that we do not believe would violate the constitution. And um, it is the, or our organization's position that this is a bill that uh, should be passed. So with that said, it is um, very dry groundwork for what statute of limitations for adult survivors of child abuse is, uh, I would like to turn things over to our moderator, uh, Kristen Gibbons Fedden, who will then introduce our panelists today, which are our real stars of, of, of the show and an opportunity to, to really talk about why this is meaningful. Um, Kristen, uh, for anyone that is not familiar with her, is a fantastic advocate for survivors of, of sexual abuse and abuse in general. And after I walk through her bio, if you don't know her, you, you will certainly be impressed, especially when you uh, have a chance to have a discussion with her today. She is widely regarded as one of the nation's leading litigators in the field of sexual abuse and civil rights. She has been on television as a moderator and a commentator on, on multiple issues, as well as for the cases that she has worked on in the past. Um, she has proven herself to be a fearless advocate when she's in the courtroom in several high profile cases. She is also someone that has worked very closely as a prosecutor in Montgomery County, where she served as captain of the domestic violence and elder abuse units, and as a member of the sex crimes unit. She is a frequent commentator for CNN, CBS, ABC, Fox, NPR, and BBC. She sits on multiple boards, including one that PCAR highly respects, as Kristen is a board member of Aquitas, which is a national resource center for law enforcement investigating and prosecuting sex trafficking and other crimes. Uh, I could go on for a lot of other things for what Kristen has in her bio, but I would love to have an opportunity to turn things over to her so that she can speak and we can hear from our panelists today. So with that, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and turn things over to Kristen. Thank you so much, Jim, for that beautiful introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you more importantly for giving us the overview of the legal landscape that kind of brings us here today and was one of the you know, beginning grounds for why you as our great leader, planner and motivator, Jim, have created these series of town halls for us to educate everyone. 
And um, I'm just really honored to be here today to introduce uh, two stars uh, who are going to be our speakers for today, the lovely Cassie Elson and Laura Fortney. Cassie, I'll begin with Cassie to introduce her. Cassie is Blackburn Center's Community Education Coordinator. She holds a master's degree in criminal justice with a focus in victimology from Kent State University and has been involved in victim services since 2015. In her role at Blackburn Center, Cassie is responsible for community outreach and professional training, which includes advocacy work, domestic and sexual violence education, bystander intervention, preventing sexual harassment at work, and general information telling. She is also a member of the medical advocacy team and the counseling team, accompanying victims and survivors of domestic abuse and sexual assault at local hospitals and seeing individual clients. In addition to her work at Blackburn Center, Cassie volunteers at Pittsburgh's Action Against Rape, where she received her sexual assault counselor certification in 2016 and continues to help staff the 24 seven crisis line. And we also have Laura Fortney McKeever. Laura is one of the five sisters um, that is a survivor and dynamic advocate for child sexual abuse. The Fortney family became known after the 40th grand jury bombshell report that put a spotlight on clergy sexual abuse in the Catholic church. The Fortney family has devoted much of their time and effort on advocating for statute of limitation reform and educating the public on child sexual abuse, especially grooming. So we are just so thankful to you, Cassie, and you, Laura, for just being willing to just share your time, your stories, and all of your knowledge with all of us. Um, so without further ado, Cassie, I'd love to begin with you to kind of give us an overview on the dynamics of sexual abuse and assault. Sure, so thank you, Kristen, so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm so honored to be here. Um, I'm, I'm ecstatic to be standing next to you and Jim and Laura and all of these other wonderful advocates um, and champions in this field. Um, it's, it is truly an honor. So uh, thank you for that. In terms of the kind of the base dynamics of abuse and assault, um, we work with clients every day at Blackburn Center um, who have experienced all different forms of violence or abuse in their lives. Um, we do have therapy and counseling services available for children as well as for adult survivors of child sexual abuse. And so from that standpoint, um, our agency is very familiar with these issues and with the importance of this legislation that we're talking about um, in terms of statute of limitations. One of the biggest things that I want to make sure to point out is that when children are sexually abused, it is very different in terms of the way that they process that abuse than it is for adults who experience assault. Um, there are so many reasons that we could talk about all day for that. Um, but one of the one of the things that we hear frequently from adult survivors of ch child sexual abuse is that many times they don't realize what happened to them or that what happened to them was wrong until years and years later. Um, children's minds also are very good at blocking out trauma as they grow older. It's a survival mechanism. And so when we're talking about reporting in a certain amount of time, um, you know, that time frame for children who have experienced this type of abuse varies greatly. There are some children who are able to put words to what happened to them a little bit earlier earlier on, and some who have blocked out trauma and abuse until their later adulthood. And so giving more time for survivors of child sexual abuse to come forward, to speak up, to say what happened to them, and to hold accountable the people who hurt them, it's essential to, to allow that extra time. And it only makes sense to allow that extra time. Um, and, and as I said, we, we hear that from our clients, we see it over and over and over again, that as adult survivors begin to work through the trauma, they want that time to be able to, um, to really speak their truth and to be able to be heard and to have it count for something in their minds that it doesn't if they are not able to hold those people accountable. 
Um, so those are, you know, just again, we could talk about this and the, the impact of child sexual abuse for a very long time, but I want to make sure that it is understood that when somebody is abused as a child, it doesn't end there. Um, even if the physical act of abuse ends when they are a little bit older as a child, it doesn't end there. It continues to um, be something that they have to process, that they have to live with. And there are effects of child sexual abuse that the survivor is not going to recognize until much later in their lives. And we at Blackburn Center, we have the privilege of working with some of those survivors hearing from them and hopefully being able to speak on their behalf when they're not able to, um, to point out that there needs to be more time for them to be allowed to come forward and to see justice done. Thank you so much, Cassie. Really appreciate that. Um, it was great knowledge and oversight. Laura, I'd love to turn it over to you. Um, to talk about, you could even talk about some of the things that Cassie was saying, being a survivor of child sexual abuse yourself, and also share your story as well as your family story. Sure, thank you, Cassie, for that. And yes, I am a product of what she was talking about. Um, and you know, I just want to thank um, PCAR. You know, we are so grateful um, to organizations like Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape that do so much to support um, the healing of survivors uh, and our path to justice as well. Um, I'm sitting before you as one of five sisters who have been abused um, by the same um, pedophile priest, someone who we trusted and um, look to um, in high regard and high esteem. I mean, he was next to God to us. And these, these are my sisters. I have to show you guys a picture of them so you can put a name and a face together. Um, I'm one of nine children, eight girls, one boy, um, and not just uh, five sisters, but a niece who was also abused by the same priest. And uh, in 2016, uh, my youngest sister of the nine, um, she came forward. Uh, it was actually Spotlight the movie. I highly recommend if you haven't watched that movie, it actually won um, the Golden Globe Award, or I guess it's, what is it called? The Academy Award um, that year for best picture. And I remember personally, I was watching that award show. And at the end, when they played the trailer, that really triggered me. Um, it, it didn't trigger me for myself, it triggered me for my sister because my youngest sister's abuse came out in um, 1992 is when she first broke her silence. And it was complete hell for my family from that day forward. And in 2016, my sister Patty, who Patty is the oldest of the abused and then I'm next, um, my youngest sister called us both and said, this is it. We're, I'm done living in silence. I'm done with, you know, our story being, the, you know, her story being the elephant in the room. And she wanted to, she heard about Representative Rossi and um, how he was pursuing this fight for justice. And um, so she reached out to him and he um, had told her about the Pennsylvania grand jury um, report, the investigation that was happening. And um, invited us into his office and uh, Patty and I, we really went to support Carolyn. We didn't go for ourselves. This was always about Carolyn. And so we found ourselves sitting in there and he uh, said, would you meet the attorney general? And Carolyn was looked at us and we said yes, because we wanted to support anything. And then that's when the ball uh, got rolling and um, our life forever changed. Um, even after that point, um, it wasn't until after that meeting that Patty started calling me and started remembering things that happened to her. See, Patty and I, we always dealt with the shame and guilt because I was the first in my family to meet um, our priest. He came into my fifth grade class when I was 10 and asked for volunteers to help around the rectory. And the good little Catholic girl that I was quickly raised her, her hand. I'm not that good little girl anymore, <laughs> but raised her hand to volunteer. And um, that's when he started started the grooming for me. He, um, we believe that he knew that we were a large family already. We believe that he um, was a uh, brilliant 
calculus in the way of, um, and that's how pedophiles are. Um, they they know their vic they they seek out their victims, and so we we know and believe that we were targeted. And so um, it was things that you know he keyed in on things that I liked. I loved to play secretary, and he gave me an office in the rectory and all, little odd jobs, and paid me money. And then we started counting the collection, and he would give us money out of the collection to pay us. And then he'd afterwards take us to the bank to make the deposit, and we felt very like oh that we were important. And then he. He would take us to the grocery store. When you're from a family of nine, you never see the grocery store because your parents don't take you there. And we were like, literally kids in a candy store. He'd let us pick anything we want. And really he was um, grooming Patty and I and not my parents to get to the younger uh, sisters. You know, two of us were physically raped by him of the younger two. And so from that point on, when we got that call, um, to testify for the grand jury. That's when Patty and I really started to discover our abuse. There were different triggers that helped trigger things, but really up until that point, we repressed a lot of those and we're still discovering things. And so often I just had a conversation in the Capitol yesterday, um, believe it or not, with someone who works with the Insurance Federation, because I'll talk to everybody and anybody about this subject, that's what you have to do. And you know, you can, you can tell certain people, especially that are on the opposite side of this cause, they're so disconnected emotionally because nothing has ever happened or they think has happened to anybody in their life. And therefore they can't, they, you know, they relate those of us that were child sexual abuse victims as adults, right? And it's not, you know, sexual abuse is sexual abuse, no matter what age, but he almost had even more of an insincerity because we were adult victims now. And, and basically, well, you know, how could you not know? And how could you, you know, and listen, <laughs> I didn't even know what the word pedophile was when I was 10 years old. I didn't, I mean, my sister, Carolyn, that was abused at the age of two, starting at the age, they based on the evidence that they found when they raided his his home. We, you know, we have all the evidence because they did raid his home. Um, they estimated that she was 18 months old and for 10 years she was abused. How could a child of that age even know what sex is? You know, even know the things that happened to her, let alone to have the 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 courage, somebody that you trust and that is elevated in, a, in society and in a community held at such a high position to, to even, if you did know, to, to, to speak about it. So that um, is where our, our journey began back in 1992 with Carolyn, but for, you know, after, because of that situation, um, the, the lawyers, um, you know, and psychologists encouraged my parents to not come forward with her story, to protect her. And really that decision that my parents made, you know, was really a numb decision. You know, our whole family was numb at that point. They were just, you know, grasping at straws. And 26 years later, when Carolyn came forward, we then suffered a whole nother level of guilt. You know, there's so many layers of this because we didn't speak out. And for 26 years, how many more um, victims could we have saved? to uncover the cover up of what had happened to us. And so we, we have had the gift of discovery through the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report. We also have had the gift of discovery because our abuse also happened in New Jersey, but our pedophile priest was moved from Newark Archdiocese, which we were able to testify in front of the New Jersey uh, Judiciary Committee and they passed a two year window. So my family right now, our, you know, a lot of our time, our resources, and our money um, are proudly um, put forth, you know, towards efforts like the one that we're doing now with some of our grassroots survivor friends, and even people that aren't survivors that are finally starting to come on board and have the courage to say, how can we help, you know, to produce these postcards, and um, we just dropped a stack of them off in Corman, uh, Senator Pro Temp Corman's office, because one of the things that we as survivors, and I see some of them on here, like Mary McHale, who's a fierce advocate, and you know, just different people that um, we uh, have been told time and time again, we're not hearing from people. So we thought, you know what, 
We're going to make sure they hear from them. We're going to physically take it in, right? And so this is what we do. And we do it because we may have had the gift of the grand jury and had our discovery. See, that's what people, and I'm going to wrap up because I know my time is up, but that's what people don't realize. They think that, oh my goodness, you know, this two-year window is so that we can um, cash out on money. Well, you know what? Survivors do deserve it. I, I will tell you the average survivor in the Harrisburg diocese in the comp fund got 112, I think, or $114,000. I mean, $114,000 for your life to be taken away from you as God intended it to be. That is a pittance. I mean, <laughs> that's a pittance, but you know what? It, no matter what, it, as survivors amongst each other, we don't talk about money. You know what we talk about when we're sitting on those marble steps at the Capitol trying to figure out who's, who is going to allow us to, to talk to them next, the senators, or who's going to even allow us in, the, in their door, is that, oh my goodness, for, for every day, every day, the, the vote is on the calendar. It's been on the calendar, right? It's been on and it's stalled and they're not putting it to the floor. We know we have the votes, but, but um, you know, majority leader um, uh, Kim Ward is refusing to put it to the floor. And what we have to be in anguish over, I was just there yesterday, is that every single day that goes by, the innocence of our children is at risk. They are supporting pedophiles and not children when they don't urge Kim Ward, their leader, to put this to their floor and when she doesn't do it. And so we're doing everything in our power. We have fixthelaw.org that is a new grassroots um, paid by, by other survivors. I mean, this is our own money that we're putting towards this, you know, um, to be able to do these things just so that they see us and they continue to see us and we're not going away. These, and I'm going to end with this, these are two of my dear friends, dear, dear friends. Julian Forts and Bob Corby. She is roughly 72. This is postcard. This is a little older. Bob is 85. They are both child sexual abuse victims with the Catholic Church. And this sign says, How much longer can they wait? They want justice. And they're, they've lost, they're losing hope. And some days I talk to Julianne and, and she's lost hope, but she's, she's strong. She's a fighter. She's, she's going to keep going. Bob wants to see justice before he, he passes was his thing. And so that's why we're doing what we're doing. And that's why we thank you, PCAR, for the education to let people know the truth of what this is about, because it's truly about getting these pedophiles. Without this window, you know, there are pedophiles hidden in pre plain sight. They cannot be on a registry. You could be living right next door or uh, your pediatrician could be one of them. I have a friend that, uh, that, that it was her pediatrician, actually a bunch of friends. It could be the coach. It could be the, you know, teacher. It could be, you know, your clergy. It could be anybody. It could be your father. It could be anyone but nobody know, would know it because the statute of limitations is in favor of the pedophiles, of the rapist, and not of the children. Did you ever think when the forefathers wrote our constitution that they would ever think that there would be a cover up like this? And they didn't, you know, extraordinary times as Pat, Pat Dugan, a survivor said, it, it, it calls for extraordinary um, measures. And that's what our legislature needs to do they need to side with victims and not pedophiles. Thank you so much, Laura. And thank you so much, Cassie. I think you both um, beautifully pointed out, and I just wanna emphasize the importance of holding these perpetrators and these institutions that enabled these perpetrators accountable. Um, and you know, I think you said that, Cassie, and then Laura, I think you also summed it up as to why well, our, the innocence of our children are at risk. Yeah. And, I, and I think, you know, one of the focuses is talking about child sexual abuse for this session, but as, our, as is pointed out in our last session as well, sexual abuse survivors come in all shapes and sizes. Um, and it's not just childhood sexual abuse, it's also 
adult um, sexual abuse survivors as well. Um, but I wanted to um, open it up for questions. If anyone um, in attendance has any questions, please feel free to write it right into our Q&A or if you want to private message one of our panelists, um, including myself as a moderator, uh, if you don't want your name out there associated with your question, please do so. We're happy to answer any and all questions that you may have. Um, but before I kind of open, um, begin to ask uh, some of our other questions that have come in, um, I did want to note that, Laura, when you were speaking, um, one of our attendees did ask about the movie. Um, and I know you had mentioned that it was Spotlight and Jim um, was able to respond um, to, to um, our attendee. And I noticed that you mentioned it was very triggering. Um, did you want to speak more on that? Yeah, um, the part for me that really got me was the actor. I mean, it's an all-star cast. I mean, Rachel McAdams, like the notebook is my jam. <laughs> if anybody ever watched that, like, um, and so Mark Ruffalo did an, a phenomenal job as well, Michael Keaton. But when Mark Ruffalo said he, there was a point in there and it's actually in the trailer too. Um, and they knew, and then he said, and they did nothing about it. That was my family because the Pennsylvania grand jury report um, revealed that a teach that one of our friends, uh, childhood friends, um, our pedophile tried to do to her what he tried to do with us. And he even used us to say, well, the Fortney girl lets me do it. Well, she went to a teacher at McDevitt High School here in Harrisburg. And that teacher went to the principal. The principal went to the diocese and the diocese, which actually was Monsignor o Hugh Overball, who was our priest that would come to our home, that was uh, our pastor previous to this pastor that would come and sit and break bread with us at our home. He is the one that covered up our abuse for five years. He squelched it and hit it. And in his writing, it was discovered. You can go see the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report. It's open, just, just Google it. Anybody can see it. I mean, it's not a pleasant thing to read and it is very triggering, um, but that, that was our um, story that five years of our abuse could have been saved, five years. And during those years are when my youngest sisters were raped by him. Thank you, Laura, for sharing that. We do have another question from Sharon. Um, she shares that she's in the process of a criminal investigation um, from her perpetrator, and he was 16 at the time, and um, she was 15. Um, if she cannot get him charged, can she then try to get him charged in a civil case? Um, I will open it up to the panel. Also, as an attorney and former prosecutor, I'm also happy to answer that question. Um, Cassie, did you want to answer that or did you want me to take it? Go ahead, Kristen. This is more your area of expertise than mine. Sure, no problem. Um, and so because if the, if the prosecutor does not charge them, you certainly would have a viable civil suit against that perpetrator. Um, the civil case would be a little bit different. I don't know the jurisdiction that you're in. Um, happy to speak to you offline. Uh, you can Google me for my phone number and stuff like that. Um, but uh, oh, Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. Um, and so if you're, you, depending on your date of birth currently, um, it's such a weird complex thing. So basically long story, okay. So um, the young lady is 51. So to answer that question from a broad standpoint, um, but also to answer it for you specifically, um, the statute of limitations would currently be barred at this time without the revival window, which is why these efforts are so crucial and so important. Um, because suing a perpetrator, I'm sure would also bring you such justice. Um, yes, I can. Um, I'm just going to write my email in here um, for all of the attendees um, as requested from this particular person. Um, but just to answer the question really briefly, through the efforts, um, and you can actually find out more about this on our first session, our first town hall session, we talked a lot and more extensively about this. But in November of 2019, 
Um, although we did not get a revival window, uh, through the efforts of PCAR, um, Laura, your, your group, and all of the victim advocacy and RCC groups, such as Cassie Leaves, um, within the state, we were able to make some positive legislative moves, um, which extended the statute of limitations for victims or survivors of child sexual abuse. It also extended the um, window by which adults um, ranges 18 to 24 could um, sue a perpetrator or enabling institution if they were sexually violated um, under that, based on that negligence or that perpetrating action. However, um, the statute of limitations for child sexual abuse, which would directly impact uh, you, uh, the person who had submitted the question, was extended to age 55. And I know your common question was, well, I'm 51, so I'm still within that window. But unfortunately, it, it um, only revived it for those claims that were currently alive at the time of the enactment of the statute of limitations. What does that mean? Well, if in November of 2019, the statute had expired, which for you, since you're 51 years old, I know from doing the math previously that your statute of limitations to sue that particular perpetrator would have expired by the time that this new statute, statutory amendment had come about. Um, unfortunately, you would be barred because it only applies to and extends the statute of limitations for individuals whose statute was alive and viable at the time of the enactment. However, that's why this revival window is so important because what I want to say to you is that hope is not lost. Uh, through these great efforts, we are working for a revival window. And what the revival window will do, so one of the questions that um, she's asking now is, well, so criminal is the only way to go? No, 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 not. So right now we have a revival window. We're trying to, I'm sorry, not right now. Right now we are pushing for a revival window. So my hope is that, um, and what I mean by a revival window is kind of what Jim was talking about earlier. It will allow those with expired statute of limitation claims to now bring forth their civil action, even though their claim was expired, for a limited period of time. Laura kind of mentioned it as well when she was talking about there was a revival window in New Jersey, and it's still actually alive and well right now, but for two years, um, victims and survivors of childhood sexual assault in New Jersey are allowed to bring forth expired claims. Um, you know, and, and basically what that means is there's no action of dismissal. The, the, defense, the defense or the insurance uh, companies can't say, hey, we're kicking you out of court because you're time barred. They can't do that. And that's what we're pushing for right now in Pennsylvania. So thank you so much for your question. I hope that kind of answers it. I did put my email into the chat. If anyone has any further questions, I'm happy to kind of go through it. Um, but I didn't know if Cassie or Laura, you wanted to add anything. But Laura, if you do have something to add, I would love for you to also just add about how that impact that New Jersey had, uh, the revival window that New Jersey had on you, just because I think that that, and you did touch on it, but I'd love for you to retouch on it if you can, because I think that allowing that revival period in Pennsylvania would be so impactful for uh, survivors here who are barred, like this young lady. Oh, Kristen, wow. Well, when as soon as you asked me that, I had chills the whole all over my body because it was, it was like a ton of bricks lifted off of us. It, it um, but what it also did, it brought forth so many of his survivors, like clear, clear victims that, that are now survivors, clear back to the 60s. It validated, not that you ever want to meet survivors, you don't, but when you when we feel when they break the silence, it just and they know that they're not alone anymore. You know, so many people are living with it was only them. They're they may be blaming themselves and vacillating with that and 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 you know pedophiles they don't just have one victim <laughs> you know they they have a lot <laughs> and uh, there's more statistics about that out there but it um it it, it gave us hope to f find out we say it's like a puzzle for us you know you go through life and and there's just pieces missing to to why you become the family you've become or why you you've become who you are and this discovery that we are anticipating 
through New Jersey that we already had in Pennsylvania, just because we had the gift of the grand jury, but that so many will have when, when we have this gift of the window, right? Um, but in, in New Jersey, um, you know, it, it's discovery. It's, it's discovery. It's helping you put the pieces of the puzzle. Why, why did this happen to us? Um, how, you know, wh where, who knew? Um, who else? It, it, it's just, it's incredible. And we had, we had the incredible opportunity to meet several of those um, now survivors and you instantly know them. Your hearts instantly connect. I just want to do a little side note that if you are a survivor on here and you're not connected with other survivors, please reach out to us. I mean, go to go to um, you know we have a, a page we started Pennsylvania Survivor Strong. It's a Facebook um, uh, group just so that other survivors can reach out to us and um, know that you're not alone. You're not alone, and um, you know evil lives in the darkness. And spotlight, you know, the light, I always hear people say this, you know, light is a disinfectant and um, we're stronger together. We are. And there's someone uh, that is here to receive you with open arms. So please reach out. Thank you. And Cassie, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything to that. Um, I do uh, just Laura, especially about this last thing you said about finding a community of survivors. Um, it's uh, it's really important to me as an advocate, as somebody who works in the field, to make sure that as many people as possible know that there are agencies and groups and other survivors and counselors and people who will hear you, um, people who will believe you, uh, and people who will fight for you. Um, abuse, especially child abuse, is a very isolated event. Um, abusers and people who perpetrate type, different types of sexual assault and sexual abuse work very hard to make sure that what they're doing is kept secret. And it, they, um, you know, Laura touched on, uh, and I think Kristen did too, the, the process of grooming, um, you know, abusers really choose victims who they know they can manipulate they take their time to make sure that their victims trust them. Um, and so really everything that perpetrators do to the people they're victimizing is an attempt to keep them quiet, an attempt to keep them um, living in shame, afraid of speaking up, not having the words or the people to talk to. Um, and so I think it's just, it's so important to note that if you are a survivor, if you know a survivor, um, you're not alone. There are there are other survivors who will empathize with you and who will work through what you're processing together. Um, there are agencies uh, across the state and um, PCAR has um, contact information for all of those um, anywhere, no matter what county you're in. And I will say specifically too at Blackburn Center, we're in Westmoreland County, we're in, we're in Western PA, Southwest PA. And um, you know we get calls on our hotline from people all over the state and even in different parts of the country. We're there to talk to those people. We might not be able to offer you an in-person service, but you can call a hotline anytime in any part of the world. And I guarantee you the counselor who picks up is going to spend time talking to you. Um, so I think that's just really important. I think that also shines such a light on the importance of this legislation on having a revival window because the, the piece of speaking up and being heard and being believed is so important. And some survivors don't recognize that they uh, want that. And so it takes them a while to get there and that's okay too. But um, Laura, you used a phrase that really just stuck in my mind that you said pieces were missing um, as you were seeking justice, as you were speaking up, as you and your family were dealing with this. And what we want to do and what we are asking um, our government and our legislators to do is to give us some more time to put those pieces together, to find those pieces and to to have that space, that safe space to be heard, to be believed, and to be supported. Absolutely. And really on that note, and as we kind of come into closing, um, before I open it up to Cassie, you and Laura, just for some finishing remarks, if you wanted to share anything, Laura, I wanted to turn it over to you real quick and ask you, you had mentioned uh, that wonderful organization that I believe you and your sisters um, 
all kind of support um, fixthelaw.org. I'd love you to tell everyone about the organization and more specifically, how can we support you, your efforts, fixthelaw.org's efforts, um, and be a part of, you know, pushing forth through this legislative change? Okay. Oh, am I unmuted? Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Well, it's actually, we just, it, it came from a bunch of survivors, you know, meeting at the Capitol, thanks to, you know, rallies by um, all of the organizations like you guys and SNAP and Child USA and all, all the organizations out there that have invited us. We really just, you know, formed a family. And um, we just, we called ourselves Pennsylvania Survivor Strong. We didn't even realize that um, Heather Hogan Spencer, who's one of um, the gals that is you know a survivor uh, part of this? She was like, "Do you know that that's pass p a s s like pass like pass the window?" We were like, "Oh my god, wait, that's great!" So anyway, it was just it was really cool. And so, but we realized that you know so many people want to help, but they just don't know how to help, right? Um, what can they do? You know, before all of this, I didn't even know what a statute of limitation was. You know, I didn't know how to contact my senator. I didn't even know I was allowed to contact my senator. I didn't realize they worked for us and we don't work for them. Like people just don't understand, you know, the system and, and the fixthelaw.org website, we, um, started um, so that we could really help to educate, you know, uh, uh, just to, to, it gives even the dialogue, like they can go right on there and send an email right to their Senator from this website, you know, saying, please support this um, call to action. Anything that we do in the future, if people want to help, you know, we have people right now at the Capitol, just carrying a fix the law.org sign. So people are curious and they just go to it and then they discover, you know, what it is and the two senators that we need to make sure we're calling all of the time and everybody to call. So that's how it um, came about, just a grassroots effort um, of survivors that are like, you know what? It, it, it's part of our healing to do this. You know, it really is. It's part of our healing to feel like, you know, we're doing something. And it's part of others healing. You know, some, you, you don't, as a survivor, you know, you're not any less if you can't come and to the survivor and stand there. You know, we are standing in the gap for you when we're there. Um, but if you ever feel strong enough, come, you know, or reach out to us. And there's other ways that you can help um, just even behind the scenes. Uh, and for those that aren't survivors that are watching this, oh my goodness, you know, calling your senator, calling the majority leader, Kim Ward, and urging her to put this vote to the floor today and tomorrow. They're in session. It's a critical day. And, and you know, they're filled doing fundraisers all over town, right? And, you know, they, they'll say, you know, the budget and blah, blah, blah. But I don't know anything more that affects the budget than this right here. When children are abused as a child, it leads to drug and alcohol abuse. It can lead to eating disorders. It can lead to suicide and so many things. It's so connected, um, but they're so wrapped up in everything else. They need to get wrapped up into this and they need to find a way. You know, I always say, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If this was in your own family, how would you be handling this? what would you be doing? You would go above and beyond. You would not accept the answer. Oh, well, they messed up and you just have to wait till 2023. They would not do it because they know they have the power to change it. And we are looking for a champion, a true leader, not a leader that stands behind word and says, oh, well, we're just waiting for her to put it to the floor. No, you are a, your constituents. They voted you to be a leader of them. And while you are standing behind another leader and not encouraging her to do it, like we know that it can happen. They've got to figure it out and find a way. It's not for survivors to figure it out. They've got to get it done. Like we're not lobbyists. We're not politicians. We don't want to be. We want, we want to be with our families. We want to heal. We want to do the things like that, that are helping to promote survivors in other ways, not to put our resources towards postcards, right? This could go towards healing of survivors in our communities, right? And so there you go. Long answer.
<laughs> Can you tell my passion? Super powerful and impactful. <laughs> oh, oh. And every second worth it. Oh. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> so I wanted to just really just thank both of you guys for all of uh, your time, your insight, your expertise, sharing your story, specifically you, Laura, and your sister's story, your family story, Cassie, your knowledge. Um, but I wanted to just close out, if I could, just by turning you know the microphone kind of back to you guys. Just any um, conclusory remarks as we end our session. I don't see any further questions, um, but just conclusory remarks as we end our session. Um, uh, and Laura, you kind of hit on this too. But you know what people can really do to try to fight to abolish the statute of limitations or at the very least extend it or or as we're kind of pushing for today a revival window um any conclusory remarks and specifically what people can do not only to um push for legislative reform but to help you guys and your organizations um i if i could just leave everybody with a couple of takeaways, um, some simple kind of one, one liners <laughs> to, to give, call your senators. Um, that's huge. Call them every day. When you have a few minutes, write to them, whatever. Don't, don't give up on that. Um, like Laura said, they work for us and they need to hear from us. This is really, really important. Um, educate yourselves as much as you can. Um, the, the process around the politics and the legislation of all this is very complicated. And when the people are not well educated or are not sure how to create change or make something happen, that's when politicians are able to operate in the dark for their own agendas. So educate yourself. You don't have to take a law course, but you know, do some Googling or call a center like Blackburn Center or call PCAR um, and ask your questions. And then the last thing is um, talk about these issues. Um, child sexual abuse, domestic violence, sexual assault, they're all really uncomfortable topics. They're hard to talk about. Please talk about them anyway. Talk about it with your family, with your friends, with whoever will listen to you because the more we talk about it, the more we bring these things into the light, the more healing we can achieve. Um, and this opening up this uh, revival window would be such a huge piece of that healing for so many people. And so we have to keep speaking up. We have to keep showing up. Um, and so call, call your senators, educate yourselves and talk about it. Those are my, my ending uh, send offs, I guess. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. Awesome. I, I love that. Thank you. Uh, Cassie, I was taking notes. Um, you know, again, I'm going to quote Heather again, um, one of my friends. Um, she said the other day, she said, and you can put any title into this, but she said, priests don't become pedophiles. Pedophiles become priests. And so, and same with coaches don't become pedophiles. Pedophile or coach or pedophiles become coaches and, and, vice, and, and on and on. And the reason I say that is because, you know, education as Cassie said is so important, you know, be and, and I'm speaking to those of you that that aren't survivors or um, maybe watching this back with more of a critical ear. Um, it's so easy to try to find um, a solution for the pedophile. I've heard it many things. Oh, well, they should just be able to get married or they should be able to this and shake the baby out of this. And um, uh, so I just, I just caution you, um, just be careful, being careful of what you say, especially around children, because here's the thing, our children are listening to everything. You know, I were, I, I, you know, after I talked to the gentleman of the insurance federation and he told me I had kids, I am concerned for his kids because <laughs> I'm, I'm fighting for his kids, actually. He's fighting against this, which helps his children. But I'm concerned for maybe what the discussion was last night at home that his kids may overhear. Because, wow, kids are so impressionable. And if we are talking, you know, if we are not understanding this, this situation around child sexual abuse and, and you know, because I, I know that I've lost... May, I may have lost a friend or two over this because they just don't understand it. You know, 
keep your heart and your mind open to it. Listen to survivors, listen to these forums more. And I just commend those of you that are listening right now. And I thank you for that because as Cassie says, education is key and it's important, but also to not count on anyone else to educate your children on um, groom, you, you know, learn about grooming and, and how it can potentially start. And, and that is key too. So thank you. Thank you, Kristen, for letting us have that final word because those thoughts were going through my head. <laughs> And, and real quick, I, I want to say too to the survivors on here, thank you so much for being brave enough to even just come on here. I mean, it takes a lot. I mean, I, I know how hard it has been for me um, to get on forums like this. Um, but the more you do it, I, I don't want to say the easier it gets, but um, it will be more healing. And that's my prayer for you, for all of you. Thank you, Laura. Laura, Cassie, Kristen, thank you so much for your time, for the you know, bravery to tell your story and lending your expertise and, and experience so that we can all learn from it and hopefully affect a, a positive change. Um, Kristen, thank you to, to Saltz, Mangaluzzi, and Bendeski for your time today also. Um, one of the things that we have in the chat for anyone that hasn't seen it is if you feel a need for counseling, if you want to talk to a the counselor or get more information from a local rape crisis center. You can find that at our website at pcar.org or you can call our 800 number at 888-772-7227. Be in touch with someone for free and confidential counseling uh, and advice at 24-7. Um, um, we were going to have this recorded and this will be posted on our website. But if you do have any other questions, you can feel free to email us at info at pcar.org. So with that, we thank you all for your time and thank you all for your support for survivors. Uh, we hope you have a good rest of your day and uh, we will provide a link for this once it becomes available. Thank you everyone.